For everyone with an interest in NASH, or more broadly, fatty liver disease, Surf's Up, Season 3, Episode 12 of Surfing the NASH Tsunami. Our look at some of the specific challenges faced in treating non-Hispanic Black Americans starts now. This week on Surfing the NASH Tsunami. One of the things that I live with every day in drug development is healthcare disparity and treatment disparity. There's only been two prospective trials ever done to determine the prevalence of NASH. Both were done in San Antonio in our cohort of patients presenting for routine colon cancer screening. And as Yanni, you mentioned, the prevalence of fatty liver is very, very low. The prevalence of NASH is even lower, around 5%. So it makes it very challenging to understand the population. Maybe we have to define that a minimum of 15 to 20% of all studies have to be made up of different ethnic communities to get a broader range addressing some of the comments that Donna was making. We have to encourage, when we look at the COVID vaccine studies, only 5% were made up of ethnicities, yet they were largely more greatly affected than the other Caucasians. I just want to underscore that well before we get to a trial that doesn't have significant participation rates with African Americans and are wondering about what we are missing, we need to fix that recruitment. It's also important to note that it is still the second most common cause of cirrhosis in this ethnic group. Once Black Americans actually get NAPO the progression to NASH in terms of frequency is very similar. Also, the severity is very similar as white Americans. This protective effect that we've been talking about in Black Americans could be potentially a misconception that can contribute to understanding of Black Americans and leading to disease progression. Okay, what we found out in terms of study of the liver cancer, the pyrocellular carcinoma, is African Americans progress very slowly towards cirrhosis. But once they get cirrhosis, they actually go faster developing this end-stage liver disease, which is the HCC. Uh, and they don't necessarily quite for liver transplantation, and that's another issue with the social determinants of health. Some of the work that I'm dealing with, food insecurity, where I'm starting to screen my patients for food insecurity in clinic, and we'll have our nutritionists do that as well. The next steps are not just recognizing this as a problem, but then figuring out for those who are most vulnerable, who are experiencing food insecurity, how do we then connect them to community resources, like access to food banks or healthy eating programs. This is a fantastic opportunity because we're writing Black history now. This day will someday be part of Black history, so let's write it in a way that we can all be proud of our participation. Every week, a global community of fatty liver disease stakeholders comes together to explore the most important challenges in diagnosing, treating, and developing medications for patients with fatty liver diseases. Join hepatology researcher and key opinion leader, Dr. Stephen Harrison, liver wellness advocate Louise Campbell, pricing and forecasting guru Roger Green, and this week's guests, Global Liver Institute founder and CEO Donna Cryer, hepatology researchers, and key opinion leaders, Drs. Ani Kardashian and Zaki Sharif, and Novo Nordisk Nash MSL Dr. Yanni Adiri as they discuss unique challenges facing non-Hispanic Black Americans with NAFLD and Nash. This week on Surfing the Nash Tsunami. So first of all, we are now doing this for the second time in, Louise, I guess, three episodes. We are having at least three folks on this episode who've never been part of the podcast before. That's exciting, and we are covering a topic that we've not really talked about a lot before, which is we've noted several times on the podcast that for reasons having to do largely with genomics, that non-Hispanic Black Americans do not have Navel or Nash as high a rate as some other groups do. But nonetheless, the rate at which it exists would have been considered really high 10 years ago before everyone else's rates started to take up. And when, in fact, people do have fatty liver disease, some of the same challenges that exist for them and other liver diseases exist here as well. So we thought we'd bring in a cast of characters and take a day and talk about that. First of all, let me say hi to Stephen and Louise, who I think you all know well. Stephen, how are you doing today? Hey, Roger. I'm doing great. It's great to see all these awesome faces today. I agree. And Louise, how are you? I'm doing great also. Looking forward to this episode a great deal. In fact, Louise is doing really well. She's excited about the episode. And in the tradition of our banter about uh, Premier League football, my team did her team a big favor yesterday. Okay. The other person we have with us, who I think you know well, is Donna. Hey, Donna, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you. So we have the band back together. Louise is here, Don is here, Steven's here. And then we've got some new side players with us as well. First of all, let me say hi to Yanni Aderi, who is a medical science liaison at Novo Nordisk, a PharmD from Howard University, and the woman who pitched me on the idea that this was an episode worth doing. And although she doesn't sell for a living exactly, sold this idea to me. Yanni, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, Roger. How about you? I'm doing great. I'm glad to have you here. Yanni has, on occasions, been in the live audience and coached us, coached me mostly on what people were and weren't doing. But this is the first time she's actually uh, made a contribution where you 
you can hear her voice, and that's a great thing. Moving around my screen, um, next to her, I have Dr. Zaki Sharif, also from Howard University. Uh, Zaki, how are you doing today? I'm doing just fine. Thank you very much. Delighted to have you with us. I'll ask you to introduce in just a second. Finally, Dr. Ani Kardashian from uh, USC. And uh, Ani, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here today. Yeah, we are as well. So with that, let me go back around to Yanni, and I'm going to ask each of our three first-timers, take a couple of minutes and tell us about your work, what you do, how you got to where you are, what your interest in this topic is, and please finish with one fact that we wouldn't know about you if you didn't tell us. And there I'll tell you, you're up against some stiff, stiff competition, but uh, go ahead. Yanni, start us off. Awesome. Thank you so much, Roger. My name is Dr. Yanni Adiri. I'm a pharmacist by training and a medical science liaison on the NASH team at Nova Nordisk. I've been at Nova for the last two years, and I've had the opportunity to work in the NASH space. And what I've realized is that it's totally surfing. It's, you know, ups and downs and learning new things and being surprised each and every step. And so as a medical science liaison, my main responsibilities are maintaining and developing those relationships with hepatologists and GIs and really staying up to date on what it is that NASH is. And, and the podcast has served a huge role in keeping me updated and keeping me informed about issues. It's safe to say that this podcast has served as an inspiration for me in the past and definitely excited and thrilled to be here today. I will say something that no one would know about me if I didn't say would be that I like to build patio furniture. I've done it for my parents' house. And uh, I would say that that was a product of COVID and the pandemic and isolation. So uh, that would be my fact, Roger. You know what? I think that's a first. Louise, have we ever had a patio furniture builder? No, we've not. Now, it depends if it's an Ikea patio furniture or, or you build it yourself from scratch. <laughs> Although I'm sure Stephen has built brilliant sandcastles of patio furniture. I don't know that we've had anyone who's actually built furniture. So, Zaki, go ahead. Take a couple minutes. Tell us about yourself and then one thing we wouldn't know. Okay. First of all, I'd like to thank you and Yanni for inviting me to this. So, my background is that I am actually a product of the studies that involves P53, if you know P53 is what's called the guardian of the genome. That's a protein that's supposed to be a tumor suppressor gene protecting us from all the calamities of our daily lives. And I was at Stanford University when we looked at a disease called leaf Ramani syndrome. And this is a disease that is peculiar because every member of the family has multiple primary cancers. We studied that particular family and the underlying mechanisms, biological, genetic mechanisms. And I was able to identify two novel mutations in the P53 gene. That led us to transitioning to Georgetown University from Stanford. We continued with the P53 gene and then when I came to Howard University, I was basically solicited to come back. That's my alma mater, by the way. Uh, and then I switched to health disparities, especially with uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. I did a study and I found out in Washington, D.C. there was about 500% increase in HCC from 1959 to 2013 and that really triggered my interest in, in this particular disease. And of course, I wanted to trace it all the way back to NAFLD and NASH. And that's basically how I got involved in these two areas as well. Oh, one thing that is that you don't know. Well, I came to this country from Ethiopia. I came at the age of 14 on a university scholarship. I'm sure nobody would probably figure that out if I don't tell them. And the other thing is I still have the record for long jump as well as high jump in my high school. I was told I still hold that record. So, so Zaki, just one thing before I go on, which is, Siani, how old were you when you came here? Uh, also 14. <laughs> and from? Uh, Ethiopia. So, you know, you'd be surprised. I might as well give this background that I reached out to Dr. Sharif when I saw his work in HCC, and I thought it was great, and I thought he'd be a great addition to this podcast. And as I was Googling him, as we all do, I see his name relating to Ethiopia, and I thought that was interesting. So I mentioned to him, I said, you know, I'm also Ethiopian, and we had a conversation about it. But post-talking to him, we realized we had a lot of things in common, such as we both came here from Ethiopia around the same age. So, uh, Ani, welcome. Ani's not been on the podcast before, but uh, her work has been discussed a couple of times, actually by Louise, championed by Louise, if I will, in, in terms of believing its import on a lot of the things that we care about here. That work being on food insufficiency, for those who don't recall, Ani, welcome. Introduce yourself and let's see if you can top the synchronicity of two people who came from Ethiopia at 14. I think that's going to be a yeah. tough, <laughs> tough order. Yeah. It's going to be a, it's a, it's going to be a hard one to top. Well, well, thank you so much for the invitation to be here today. It's such an honor to be invited and to be a part of this conversation. So thank you. I'm an assistant professor of medicine at the Keck School of Medicine at USC. 
USC, University of Southern California. So I'm a transplant trained uh, hepatologist and I'm currently working at the Keck Liver Transplant Center. And I also work at our county hospital, the Los Angeles County USC Hospital, which serves our Los Angeles safety net population. So my research interests really focus on the intersection of social determinants of health and in particularly food insecurity, which we'll talk a little bit more about, and chronic liver disease, particularly NAFLD and NASH. All throughout my training as a resident, as a fellow, GI fellow, transplant fellow, I've worked in many different urban safety net hospitals in Los Angeles and San Francisco. And those experiences are really what had an impact on me. I saw many of my patients really being impacted by social factors and how much those social factors, for example, housing instability, inadequate nutrition, lack of access to food, how that really impacted their outcomes even before they presented to me for liver transplant evaluations and how that really impacted their ability to undergo transplant evaluations and transplant and as well as their longer term outcomes. So that's a little bit on my background and food insecurity came up uh, really and I sort of became interested in it during the COVID pandemic. So food insecurity itself, it refers to the limited or uncertain availability of nutritionally adequate foods or the inability to acquire foods in socially acceptable ways. And it's really a result or reflection of poverty and lack of financial resources. And as the U.S. saw this sort of rapid rise in rates of food insecurity during the pandemic, with now over 50 million people affected, that made me wonder how this was going to impact my patients with fatty liver and NASH and and obviously those long-term consequences as well, including developing cirrhosis as well as mortality. That's where my interest came from. I think the paper that you and Louise were referring to are the one where we looked at this national sample of people with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and significant fibrosis and and the impact of food insecurity on long-term outcomes. And we did see some significant associations, which I can go into later, but a little bit about one interesting thing about me is I just became a mom last year, which was really exciting. And I have an eight month old daughter and I'm from Los Angeles and I'm a diehard Dodgers fan. So uh, I'm not great at sports, but I love to watch. So, Ani, you said you had an eight-month-old daughter. Stephen immediately sat up, although his uh, kids are a little young for that. <laughs> they grow up in a hurry. Just remember that the old adage is the days drag by, but the years fly by. Yeah, starting to feel that way already. Mm-hmm. I have two grandchildren, and I saw my four-year-old granddaughter for the first time in two weeks on Saturday. Two weeks not being a big deal, but she'd grown an inch in the interim. And it was like, oh, wow, do, do I have this wrong? And her mother said, no, you don't have this wrong. That actually happened. Enjoy the ride. It's amazing. And Stephen's right. I agree. It goes way too quickly. With that, why don't we go to Groundbreakers? We have seven people. We're 13 minutes in, so just make it one good thing, professional or personal, that happened in the last week that you'd like to talk about. Brave one, go first. I'm very excited about an expansion on the Global Liver Institute team. I I think particularly Dr. Harrison can appreciate we are bringing on board a new chief of staff, and he formerly served as chief of staff for the Secretary of the Air Force. So trying to, you know, bring a little more military precision to this growing operation we have over here at the Global Liver Institute. Eventually, if we grow professional enough, I'll be able to hire from Army. Clearly. There you go. I was just going to say, you, know, you got to start somewhere. Well, we've got to start somewhere. So, Stephen, the question I have for Donna is on Stephen's metaphor range from the Wright brothers to fifth generation strike fighters, uh, where, where where do you think you're at right now? I will let my new chief of staff tell me. <laughs> She's at well, the A-10 Warthog stage. She's mowing down Nash. All right. Next. Oh, I'll jump in next. My good thing is to see Donna again because I haven't seen Donna for months. We've been busy. There will be a lot come spring uh, to see here at the Global Liver Institute. You know, like all great bulbs and seeds and those things that are doing a lot of fabulous things underground in the winter. And then come spring. Wow. You're just going to be amazed. Okay, I'm going to attempt to top Donna. I don't have a personal thing, but I'm into these like motivational phrases and little concepts. And one we've been working on with our team that is very apropos to Nash is this. Grapes must be crushed to make wine. Diamonds form under pressure. Olives are pressed to release oil. Seeds grow in darkness. Whenever you feel crushed, under pressure, pressed, or in darkness, you're in a powerful place of transformation. Just trust the process. Exactly. Can I get an amen? Is there a witness in the house? Amen. There you go. Love that. Okay. (laughs) Love it. Stephen, uh, I hope you'll be sending autographed copies to panelists and maybe audience members who request. That's fantastic. Thank you. All right. Next. 
I will go ahead. I'll have both personal and professional. Personal is I just recently reunited with my dog, who's a puppy. And while Annie's talking about her baby, you know, mine was also a baby. I came back from a two-week vacation and she was extremely grown. So that was awesome. I think the professional best thing that happened last week is just being able to plan and come on this podcast. Like I mentioned, it is an honor to be a part of Trailblazers that really advancing the Nash agenda. So that's the professional aspect. That's great. Um, Zach, Yanni, go ahead. One good thing for personal professional that's happened in your life in the last week. Professional, we just enrolled our second participant. This is a study participant for the long haul COVID-19 study. We have a huge grant from NIH for that. And we have, what, 892 participants to go. But it was exciting to get our second participant enrolled. The other thing, personal, coming to this meeting and joining you in this session, that's personally gratifying already. Thank you. Thank you, both of you, for that. Ani, go ahead. Sure, I'll share something personal. So my daughter started saying mama for the first time last week, which was pretty cool. I don't know how intentional it was. <laughs> She's only eight months old, but I've been actually trying to get her to say dada so that when she wakes up in the middle of the night, my husband has to get up, not me. But we're, uh, we're working on that one still. <laughs> Good, good luck with that. <laughs> so I, I think my personal best is going to be, this is the first time anybody's ever said that their personal or professional groundbreaker best was coming on the podcast. And we've now had that twice from, ironically, two people who emigrated from Ethiopia at the age of 14. This is really going to get crazy in a little while. You realize that, don't you? <laughs> so I'll just stop there and let us go on. I've kind of mentioned this already, but I will. But this is Black History Month in the U.S. For those who don't live in the U.S. and listen to this podcast, typical week, we have 28 or 30 countries we get listeners from. So some might be aware even outside the U.S., but not all. So we wanted to do an episode in Black History Month that was, well, this disease doesn't have that long a history. So you couldn't exactly make it about the history of Nash or Naffold because you wouldn't be going back far enough. But to take a look at things that we do know are historically true about social determinants of health as they affect non hispanic Hispanic African Americans and how that might interplay with Nash, Navold, other liver diseases to create some treatment challenges that are unique that people who treat Nash and Navold or involved in this community might not think about often enough. So globally, that was the idea that Yanni brought to me and said, gee, can we do something about Black History Month and social determinants of health? And that was a couple of months ago, and here we are. Yanni, why don't you kick us off, take a couple of minutes, share a little more about your thinking in suggesting the episode and what you hope for people who are listening to take away broadly from what we're talking about today. Sure. Thank you, Roger. And as you mentioned, I think that it's important to highlight this topic, especially in the month of Black History Month, and specifically because we have epidemiological studies that show that the prevalence of NAFLD is lowest in Black Americans, but it's also important to note that it is still the second most common cause of cirrhosis in this ethnic group. In addition to that, looking at work that was done by Brill and colleagues, once Black Americans actually get NAFLD, the progression to NASH in terms of frequency is very similar. And then also the severity is very similar as white Americans. And so what that tells us is this protective effect that we've been talking about in black Americans could be potentially a misconception that can contribute to underscreening of black Americans and leading to disease progression. But not just that, right? There are other myriad of factors that are actually far stronger determinants of health outcomes than medical care in black Americans and that social determinants of health. And so Dr. Kardashian has touched on her work and what she does in that field. And so when we're saying social determinants of health, which honestly, that term has been brought about so much during the pandemic. We're talking about access to health care, education, income. We're talking about employment, as well as food insecurity issues, housing stability, and even discrimination, to name a few. We also know that, which has been very much evident during COVID pandemic, Black Americans are disproportionately burdened by those social determinants of health, leading to worse outcomes in their health, even in, in liver disease. So bringing it back to NAFL D. Nash, when we're talking talking about AJA clinical care pathways and identifying some specific groups that have been identified as high risk and emphasizing the importance of screening to ultimately prevent cirrhosis and disease progression and mortality. I believe understanding the role of social determinants in identification of high-risk groups in prevention and early intervention, as well as the management of NASH and AFLD, is very critical and it would help us with creating successful strategies as far as intervention in Black Americans. That's what the idea was and why I brought up. And I mean, there's so many amazing people on this panel that I'm excited to, to hear more about that today. Well, I'll just say I'm so grateful that she brought this topic 
forward as someone who celebrates Black history every month. This is as good a time as any to talk about it. I also, Roger, to your point about there hasn't been a long history of NASH, I think that's a fantastic opportunity to do a disease state that has equity built into it from the start. So I think this is a fantastic opportunity to make sure that inclusion of African-American organizations, as we have in the NASH Council from the very beginning of researchers who are interested in these topics and making sure that the trials are designed in ways and registries are designed in ways that we can have appropriate levels of African-Americans and then Africans when we start talking about genetic diversity in trials baked into the process so that when we have treatments or interventions, whether medical or social, from the start, we are making sure that African-Americans are included rather than waiting five years, 10 years down the line or never. In many, in many cases, we're still at the never. And so I think this is a fantastic opportunity because we're writing Black history now. This day will someday be part of Black history. So let's write it in a way that we can all be proud of our participation in it. Fantastic. Other thoughts or comments before we go on? I have a question, Roger, if yeah. you don't mind. The fact that I came to Howard University to study health disparities and, of course, Nafil D. Nash, hepatocellular carcinoma being on the top of the agenda. The question I have for Yanni is that when she mentioned the progression from Nafil D. to cirrhosis in African-Americans is much faster, and correct me if I made an error in that statement, because I have some correlation with HCC as well. Is that what you said? Then I can continue. They're actually similar. So the frequency and progression from NAFLD to NASH, as well as the severity of NASH in Black Americans was similar um, to white Americans. Okay, what we found out in terms of study of the liver cancer, the pyrocellular carcinoma, is African Americans progress very slowly towards cirrhosis. But once they get cirrhosis, they actually go faster developing this end-stage liver disease, which is the HCC. Uh, and they don't necessarily qualify for liver transplantation, and that's another issue with the social determinants of health. But uh, I thought that was a very interesting kind of intersection in studying occasions and African-Americans developing HCC at a different degree and also at different pace. So just to add to it, what Yanni said, while the rates of NAFL to NASH are, or the prevalence is lower in Blacks, we do know that outco- long-term outcomes are, are poorer. So there's been a couple of studies out of the, using the nationwide inpatient sample, cross-sectional analyses that have really investigated outcomes in hospitalized people with NAFLD and have found that Blacks have higher rates of mortality than whites. And this also extends to just sort of healthcare utilization and hospital discharges and length of stay. So we do know that despite perhaps there are lower risks, and, and, and how much of this is also, as Donna mentioned, how much of this is from lack of representation in clinical trials as well. Um, but despite that, we are seeing poor long-term outcomes in Black Americans. So I hope we can highlight this and and show how important it is that we start to study where the gaps in understanding um, these disparities are. Is it uh, lack of screening? Is it sort of underdiagnosing people? Is it lack of access to care? So really research should focus on why these disparities exist and how we can then use our understanding to change differential outcomes in different racial and ethnic groups. Thanks, Antony. Before I turn to Zaki and ask him to talk about his work, I want to see if anybody would like to run with Annie's question a little bit. Where are the most important places to be looking, do you think? What does the work that you've done or, or read or involved with tell you about that? I really appreciate Dr. Sharif's comments about HCC. That's where I was going to lead. We know that the outcomes are so drastic and so tragic with, by the time African-American men get to liver cancer, it's 60% higher and more deadly than for Caucasian men. And for African-American women, it's 30% higher than for their Caucasian counterparts. That leads me to believe that we need to be focusing earlier and earlier in the process and investigating why there is or may be this protective effect while there's still a chance to intervene. Instead of waiting for everyone to finally arrive at the doors of the transplant center with very advanced liver disease, it seems to me even more important for this population that we focus on prevention and controlling the controllable risk factors and uh, intervene in a way where people's bodies have a chance to heal themselves. As we've talked about things in the larger NASH conversation about the value of non-progression as an endpoint and as a focus of conversation, I think that may be even more important when we talk 
talk about African-American patients. I'd also just like to suggest that since NASH at this stage, unfortunately, is still biopsy defined, that that may have a disproportionate effect on African-Americans and other underserved, medically underserved populations who have less access to medical care. And so they're far less likely then to receive something as advanced as a biopsy and so aren't even included in the formal NASH diagnosed population. I just think those two areas that we've discussed in many ways across the NASH community or in some sectors, certainly not mine, but as nice to haves, they may really truly be need to haves when we start talking about African-American patients. I'd like to add something else here is that at Howard University Hospital, we found out that a lot of the patients who come and present at uh, advanced stage of liver disease, especially progressing towards uh, HCC, are usually coming at a very late stage of the disease. And we always wondered why that was the case and maybe the social determinants of health that Yanni and also Annie talked about may uh, contribute to that. But the other aspect of it is also fear of kind of confronting their issues in the presence of uh, a physician, even African-American physicians, uh, because of the history that dates back decades. That also should be factored into that uh, social determinants of health. And then the other thing is when we look at, for example, the and how often does NASH lead to cirrhosis? Between 5 to, I believe, 12 percent of people with NASH eventually progress to cirrhosis. But when you look at how long does it take for NASH to become cirrhosis, it used to be, in fact, what the chapter that I wrote about NASH and NAFLD, I did say it, it took decades. But now the recent studies indicate it may take two years to develop cirrhosis from NASH. And in that that sphere of time, the African-American community uh, may not necessarily fare well because even though it takes longer to develop cirrhosis, once cirrhosis has already started, the progression to the end-stage liver disease is very fast. And that's something that really caught my attention, but it's not really well documented uh, in, uh, or at least attention is not paid to it as much in the public health sphere. I keep listening. And one of the things I keep thinking about, Stephen, is I go back to last week's episode when uh, Mazen Nuri was talking about the idea over time to use combinations of non-invasive tests, NITs, many liquid, in fact, to get a much better read on exactly what the disease was on a patient-by-patient -patient level. Now, one of the problems I've always had with biopsy is just doesn't tell you very much. So if we're dealing with different disease dynamics in the black community than we are in the Caucasian community, accepting the idea that people don't get decent medical care and this is kind of at the front edge, is it likely over time that one of the things you might be in a position to discover uh, either history, nail NIT or other NIT work is tests that will tell us what these differences are and how to manage or treat them better? Yeah, I think so. I've listened and it's been a very interesting conversation. One of the things that I live with every day in drug development is healthcare disparity and treatment disparity. So as I think, Ani, you mentioned and others, we don't put very many African Americans in clinical trials for NASH. I've sat here and tried to think about the numbers relative to what we've talked about. So there's only been two prospective trials ever done to determine the prevalence of NASH. Both were done in San Antonio in our cohort of patients presenting for routine colon cancer screening. And as Yanni, you mentioned, the prevalence of fatty liver is very, very low. The prevalence of NASH even lower, around 5%. So it makes it very challenging to understand the population, even if you are able to study it, because it's infrequent relative to other races and ethnicities. So for instance, since we don't really understand the genetic influences for the underpinnings of why patients don't get the more severe form of NASH, but yet why they are enriched potentially for hepatocellular carcinoma. And I think to Zaki's point about once you become cirrhotic and there is increased predilection for hepatocellular carcinoma, I wonder if some of the other influences that drive HCC are in play in this population. And again, it's unknown in my mind because we just don't study them in a large enough numbers to know. What's the role of smoking in this population relative to HCC in a cirrhotic alcohol? What about genetic poly risk scores? You know, are we enriching for some genetic influence that we don't yet know or understand? Uh, where does diabetes and obesity finally 
only come into play in this population? Is it that shift from a cirrhotic patient to hepatocellular carcinoma? We're not sure. And why did it not play a bigger role in progressing a NAFLD to a NASH and a NASH to cirrhosis? And why is it now coming into play on the HCC side? And then finally, as you mentioned, access to these clinical trials. It's not just we're not enrolling a large number of patients. It's access to these patients is challenging as well. And then if you can get them in the trial, are the response to therapy different? You know, do they respond differently to a THR beta or a pan or a GLP-1 or a, you know, OCA or, or other FXR agonist? I mean, are there mechanisms that are more targeted toward this particular population? And then that finally gets me around to your point, Roger, about non-invasive testing strategies. Are there biomarkers that are more typically elevated in this population than, say, a Hispanic, Caucasian, or an Asian population? Would it be more appropriate to do fibrous scan or less appropriate? That brings into question the FAST score. Would it be more appropriate to do MRIs, MR elastography, the MAST score, the MEFIB score? Would it be better to do blood-based technologies like NIS4? We don't know because we just don't study that enough, and maybe that's where NAIL and IT could really help address that issue. We are enrolling a lot of our constituents throughout the South as part of the NAIL NIT initiative, so hopefully we would have an enriched population of African Americans that would be able to be studied appropriately. But it's a huge issue with disparities in this population relative to everything we've talked about today. Roger, I just would like to add to what Dr. Harrison just said. There was actually a, um, well, GAIN study, which I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with, Dr. Harrison, talked about something similar to that aspect where it was an observational study to identify the determinants of fibrosis progression in about 1,000 NASH patients using real-world data. Well, the, the analysis that I'm talking about anyway, the GAIN study is much larger. And what it showed was that, among other things, smoking was actually was associated, including lack of uh, full employment, was associated with significant fibrosis progression. And so to that aspect, I think that just, you know, you mentioned so many things and so many things that we have questions about. We're just now getting to understanding some of the facts, and I think it's important to really go deep to truly make the connections. The other thing I want to add, if, Roger, if you allow me, is that what Stephen just said, we actually did a biomarker study using high throughput technologies like metabolomics, transcriptomics, comparing Caucasians and African-Americans taking tissues. We're talking about HCC patients as well as serotic patients and then taking tissues as well as blood. And we did identify metabolites, especially through the metabolomic study using this gas chromatography, liquid chromatography, and mass spectrometry, that there are certain metabolites in the lipid phase that are highly upregulated in African-Americans, whereas they are normally uh, kind of regulated in uh, Caucasians. And then there are other metabolites that are highly upregulated in Caucasians and in the opposite direction in African Americans. Of course, these are discoveries, but not necessarily evidence-based because to have an actual evidence that these are the drivers for the disparity, we have to do direct experimental work, taking all these metabolites and then infusing them, of course, in cell culture and see what kind of signaling molecules would be driving the, the process of fibrosis and what have you. So we did find a lot of biomarkers between the two ratio. Uh, actually, we call it a racial disparity in hepatocellular carcinoma patients uh, between African American and, and Caucasian. So we have some evidence there, but there's more work that has to be done. Absolutely. It was a larger sample, and, and we had about 200 samples. I think we need about 1,000 samples uh, to get a, a good uh, power for the sample size, as well as to determine this is a population-based kind of uh, evidence. One of the things I wanted to say is that to see Stephen's comments, it is really important. I just want to underscore that well before we get to a trial that doesn't have significant participation rates with African Americans and are wondering about what we are missing, we need to fix that recruitment. I'm excited to partner with Summit Research and with all clinical trialists in this area as the Global Liver Institute and as our Liver Action Network you know, grows across the country. I do believe there is an untapped potential of people talking to 
their neighbors, of people talking to people, people talking to other patients about the value of participation in clinical trials that we really need to activate. And I'm really excited to do so because otherwise these drugs will still be approved and African-Americans will still be expected to take them. And we'll just have to be sort of going on faith like we do with all the other medications that have no African-Americans in their trials and just cross our fingers and hope they work for us. And so I want to do better here in NASH. I want to do better here in hepatology. And I think we can. Let me ask you a question. So I do NASH research every day. I live in a city that is not enriched with African-Americans, but where I trained and went to undergrad and went to med school, certainly is, and we had to do research there as well. In America, we we haven't done ourselves a service of historically doing well to this racial and ethnic group when it comes to research. And there's a bit of a stigma that comes with research in this population. Are, Are we getting beyond that or are there challenges we still have to overcome? The few times where where we do have opportunities to consider enrollment in NASH trials in this population, it seems like there's still challenges in trying to show the benefits of clinical trials research as opposed to being a guinea pig and am I at more risk than benefit? I mean, how we that's a barrier that we need to break down. That's true. There is a trust deficit and there is a trust deficit because of historic treatment. There's a trust deficit because of treatment right now today. And there's a trust deficit as to what could happen tomorrow. I look though with great optimism to things like the Black Liver Health Initiative, which we honored in October. Um, and this is a group of Black transplant nurses who came out of the ivory tower uh, where they were in New York and started talking to their communities and did community needs assessments. Didn't talk about transplantation or donation or any of the things that they wanted at first. It was just, what does the community need? What does the community want? First, they started answering questions about vaccine hesitancy. Then the church that they were centering their activities with actually became a vaccine hub and vaccinated 20,000 people. And then they said, oh, what, what is this transplantation stuff that you all do. Come talk to us about that. And they have started to refer patients in for transplantation. And I would submit that a great clinical research relationship could be built on top of that as well. In the work that I have done building a multicultural division for a clinical trial research firm well in the past, there is nothing that I have in that PowerPoint deck over in my drawer there that I wrote 20 years ago that is not true today and couldn't be applied this afternoon about building trust. But it has never been fully funded and fully staffed by people of the community and people who are trusted by the community. Until such time, things will not change. For things to change, we have to do things differently. And that means Stephen's having somebody to vouch for you, somebody who looks like me, to vouch for somebody who looks like you, who knows you for the passionate, trustworthy physician who does have the patient's best interest at heart in doing this research. It takes someone who is in the community, of the community, in language, of language, of culture, explaining and holding people's hands through the trial, having consent documents that you don't need a lawyer to, <laughs> to, to read and understand and explain to your family. All those parts need to be in place so that people can trust trials and trust them in the context of their lives and participate in them with the, in the context of their lives and explain it when people are going to look at them like they're crazy for participating, whether right. in their family or in their church or in their school, but they have confidence and they are armed with the right words. And so it takes all of that sort of bridge before and wrap around of trust and translation to be able to lift clinical participation for a variety of folks who have not participated sufficiently for us to have confidence in the drugs that emerge from them. But it can be done. I was just looking at the NHIR data on ethnicities in trials, and it's about 9%. It's whether or not we need to move to formal recognition in multicultural societies and ethnic societies, like a lot of Western cultures, ourselves, the US, Europe, Australia, that we have to define. And I appreciate that Stephen is in an area that's not rich in some populations, but we do multi-centre studies. Maybe we have to define that a minimum of 15 to 20 percent of all studies have to be made up of different ethnic communities to get a broader range addressing some of the comments that Donna was making, that we have to encourage when we look at the COVID 
COVID vaccine studies, only 5% were made up of ethnicities, yet they were largely more greatly affected than a lot of Caucasians. So there is a lot of hesitancy. Obviously, I do some work within vaccine centres, and there is a distinct hesitancy among ethnic communities, but they are coming forward. More of our first doses now are of ethnicities that have been affected greatly. They're still there, but I think the dialogue has to come in all areas of healthcare, from where they're placed in wards, where they get access to care, and that's everybody. We know there's less access to liver care and people who have liver knowledge in all hospitals, except when you get to major centres. We discussed it on the nursing podcast, that was a major issue, but once you get to a major centre, you get great care. So it's a fascinating topic, but how do we enrich those populations? Donna's described some of the work that they're doing. How do we get that in a hospital? I don't know. How do we get it into the clinical trials? I don't know. People have to be represented better. We've discussed it before, but I just find the whole topic absolutely fascinating, how we get across those barriers and how we get inclusion. Yeah, I was going to say, the, the only other thing I'll add is just echoing what everybody said and what Donna has said so eloquently. In some ways, we just, we don't know what we don't know about African-Americans in NASH and NAFL because they're, we're just not including them in our clinical trials. And a lot of the data we have on disparities is in population-based studies like the NHANES or the National Nationwide Inpatient Sample and not in clinical trials, not in intervention studies where we could actually be seeing, we could actually start evaluating the impact of medications and access to care on outcomes. So I'm just going to echo what everyone else has said about how important it is that we, we prioritize different racial and ethnic groups in our clinical studies moving forward. That sounds reasonably unanimous, actually. Or absolutely unanimous. Question I guess it leads me to is what do we see as practical steps to get there and who should be taking them? Well, I would certainly, since you have a fantastic audience of industry partners who typically listen to this podcast, I would suggest that they ask a lot more questions of their CROs, make a lot more demands of their CROs, commit dollars to increasing capacity for those who have already demonstrated that they can do these work, who can build relationships relationships with HBCUs like Howard, for example, should be receiving a lot more funding for the research they do since they are already of community and have proven to be able to do high quality research. So I would like to start with where's the money and then go follow it to where it goes. And if it goes to places that we know can do this work, who have these relationships, who have a proven track record of building trust with communities that would advance this in a way that it hasn't before. You know, in, in my, some of my past work, I remember bringing both Meharry and Vanderbilt to the table in an initiative and both made contributions that were worthwhile to the effort, but only one would have been otherwise funded and recognized if we hadn't gone the extra mile. That's where I would start with those who are sponsoring studies who are paying for this work, asking that this work be done in a different way. I'm just going to follow up on what Donna was saying there. And, 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 and particularly her comment earlier about people who look like us, who we want to talk to. There was some very good work done in the Northern Territory in Australia, for example, where they upskilled Aboriginal workers to do Aboriginal care and particularly around about a hepatitis B fibroscan project because there was scepticism as to whether or not the Indigenous Australians would accept fibroscan or whether or not they would take the training. But it did really, really well and it was, and then it was given ongoing funding. That that is probably, for me, an area of strength where payers and certainly the funders can look to target, to upskill nurses within the demographic of the ethnicities that we're trying to target, because it is a strength that they've got. It's about promoting. It also draws me to the Jade Ribbon, which is Southeast Asians driving hepatitis B awareness in their own communities. So you can help drive the awareness within the community that's affected greatest to drive their own motivation and health care and get into studies and fight to be part of that because we all have to fight to be part of it if we want to be there. I'd echo exactly what Donna's saying on that and getting out there and building the strength in the ethnicity populations that we're particularly targeting in those areas, whether it's Hispanic, whether it's Indigenous Australians, whether or not it's African Americans, the communities themselves can be strengthened. We have lots of healthcare practitioners from all of those communities that are affected. So using those strengths and using that training is a great resource that we've got. And this, let me ask Donna this, International Nash Day, how do we target disparities in healthcare? 
and this particular issue on Nash Day? I think International Nash Day is a fantastic platform to get people's attention on everything important about Nash, and this certainly is. I know one of the ways that we will do that is in a panel that we're doing in collaboration with the Association of Black Gastroenterologists and Hepatologists, speaking directly to this issue. But we still have a, a, a few tweaks to the planning that I'd be happy to uh, have your have your thinking about. One aspect of International Nash Day in 2022 that we are shifting on with fingers crossed that the COVID environment will allow us. This year will certainly be hybrid and we are working with our many, many community partners inside the U.S. and outside to see where they can collaborate more closely with their communities to do the type of need assessments and build the type of relationships that we are hoping that education and screening and a lot of other things can bloom from to our earlier conversation. But happy to talk more as we lock in the program for 2022. I think that'd be great. And then maybe for Dr. Sharif, you know, you guys do a ton of colon cancer screening, I'm sure at Howard, in this population. Any thought given to prospectively evaluating the patient's livers when they come in for routine colon cancer screening? You have a, a population that's already there wanting to learn their colon health. So, you know, fiber scan or blood-based biomarkers, some sort of non-invasive assessment. Yeah, you see, the problem we have, even among the physicians on our staff is that even the awareness of NASH and NAFLD is so, so low. Even during routine uh, examination of liver diseases or chronic liver diseases, of course, the viral aspects of the disease are on the top uh, uh, list of the examination protocol, the alcohol aspect of it and what have you. And then not necessarily sometimes the co-founders may be uh, trickling into that uh, kind of thought, but awareness is our biggest obstacle right now. Uh, physicians do not really give it a high kind of visibility. And that also, we have to go down to the community and also create awareness. Like Donna was saying, this Nash Day may really impact a lot of the community members if they are made aware of that. More than the colorectal cancer screening, to answer your question, uh, Dr. Harrison, is that I did a bariatric study looking at those because we have a wellness institute at the Hospital Wellness and Weight Reduction Institute, is what it's called, I think. I believe. And these bariatric patients that are coming in in their 40s, well-to-do, especially about 80% or so of them are women. And uh, the surgeons that actually conduct this uh, removal of the fat and what have you in the abdomen area, actually, they always see a lot of fat deposit on the liver. It's only when I approach them, if we can do some kind of collaborative work, that they open that door to me, even though they're still very busy handling all this. Uh, there are only two surgeons in, in that uh, capacity. So the color screening, you know, finding maybe some aspect of fatty liver there. More so when we do the open abdominal surgery for removal of the fat in bari bariatric surgery is when really those patients that come in for that surgery actually have all these comorbidities. Hypertension, we're talking about essential hypertension. We're talking about hyperlipidemia, hypertriglyceridemia. Uh, you know, the obesity, of course, is one factor there. And then we find out this all this gastric bypass and what have you, do not necessarily reduce those comorbidities after a while. Maybe temporary resolution, but not a consistent or a lasting resolution. So it's not just the awareness aspect of it, but also the dimension of the examination is not necessarily reflecting that. And then we really have a lot of work ahead of us. And uh, I think it's uh, not just restricted to Howard University Hospital, but all over. I also adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Georgetown University, of course, has the liver transplantation, and then they have a similar population to ours, but still the um, awareness is, is not big enough. So we can fix the awareness part. If you'll set up a grand rounds for me, I'll be happy to come up there and educate your physicians on fatty liver disease. And then the other comment about, you know, the, the bariatric surgery population is a, is kind of an enriched population for fatty liver, right? The nice thing about a colon cancer screening population is you get a wide swath of the population. You're getting lean African-Americans, you're getting obese, you're kind of getting the full gamut. That's where I think you can get really impactful 
prevalent data. But anyway, I'd be happy to come up there. Absolutely. That's why we need, we have this kind of session as yeah. we you know, collaborate and we exchange uh, ideas and there you know, go. To invite you over. Absolutely. Yes. Definitely. I'm happy to have you in DC here, Stephen. You know, I was also thinking that the, the key barrier would not be so much awareness, but hospital throughput and adding time to the colonoscopy. And I have one scheduled on Friday, so I'm very, very mindful of it. And from a patient point of view, I don't think you'd mind. We're, we're woozy. We haven't eaten. Like, we don't care what, we, what you do. And so doing a quick fiber scan would be no problem. But I'm also on the hospital board. And so as I look through our throughput numbers for our outpatient surgery, I think that's where you get the pushback. And so I think if we can design a study and figure out how to be as efficient as possible, maybe as part of well, the patients are waiting or you know something like that. I think it's an intriguing idea because I was going to talk about the studies that had done liver biopsies in, in patients being prepared for bariatric surgery. And I certainly think that non-invasive testing of, of, of the liver for every bariatric surgery candidate should be just baked into the process. But I do love the evening effects of the colonoscopy. But if we can get the throughput right, then I think that we can have a winner. So we're rolling through the bottom of the hour. I want to ask Annie a question first, then I think we go the last question. And so, Annie, sitting in Los Angeles County Hospital, right, you know, big city, all that around you, what in this conversation aligns best with what you see when you work there? And what do you see as challenges and the opportunities? Yeah, so, you know, our population at LA County is primarily a Latinx and African American cohort, really. So, we are seeing a lot of people who don't have access to housing, don't have health insurance, so we we really treat an uninsured population. You know, as a community, as a GI and liver division are really trying to focus our efforts on starting clinical trials and really just studying the natural history of liver disease in populations that have like historically not been studied, like our patients that we see at Los Angeles County Hospital. I think a lot about what you all are saying about just trying to figure out ways when patients are actually coming in for procedures or are seeing the healthcare system, are engaging with the healthcare system to use those as opportunities to then sort of efficiently, um, I'm not saying collect data, but efficiently gather information about a lot of sort of the social factors that they are seeing and they're experiencing and then also figure out how in those opportunities or in those encounters to also enroll patients in clinical trials and intervention studies. And we're, we're trying to do a little bit of that now. And, you know, I'll just speak to like, for example, some of the work that I'm doing with food insecurity work just based off of the research that we've done so far. We're now starting to, and I'm starting to screen my patients for food insecurity in clinic and we'll have our nutritionists do that as well. And I think the next steps are, you know, not just recognizing this as a problem, but then figuring out for those who are most vulnerable, who are experiencing food insecurity, how do we then connect them to community resources, like access to food banks or healthy eating programs. We now have a, our nutritionists have a healthy eating voucher that they provide to patients who need it. And those are the ways that we could really intervene is by using our encounters with the healthcare system to really start asking questions about social determinants and figuring. And then from there, identifying patients who are at very high risk and connecting them to community resources and, and community partnerships. So I think it goes back to, you know, sort of community engagement. But the first step is really as providers, and I'm, a, you know, I, I work and I see patients every day. How do I first recognize those who really need these resources? So I'm seeing a chain from Zaki that goes, first of all, physicians have to look. Before you have to ask what to recognize, you have to know that you need to look. But Stephen will solve that with his grand rounds at Howard. And then you get to this issue of maybe not going directly at Nash, but having different things going on that if you look for them, then you'll see patients that you might need to be looking at more carefully in a NASH context. So not only do we ask about NASH, we ask about food insufficiency, we ask about colon cancer screening, bariatrics, other things that clearly are markers and have links so that folks are thinking more broadly or more expansively about populations at risk. I'm going to drop that on there, and then I'm going to ask a closing question. One thing you would like to see a year from now, if we had this conversation, that could actually be different and better, a realistic goal, attainable one-year time frame. Brave one, go first. I can go. One thing that really intrigues me at the same time, because I do a lot of epigenetic studies related to liver cancer, I'm really always wondering, does NASH have an epigenetic influence? But you know, more scaringly, I don't know if anyone has done any study, but epigenetic alterations do have a significant role in the course of the disease and transmission to even offspring. So are there families where NASH is developing or NAFLD, the whole spectrum, is there and are they really passing it down to the next generation? Is it something that stays within that individual person or their lifestyle as uh, food science, as uh, Annie has mentioned? Is it 
something that is uh, inherited. And that's what we're finding out as far as cancer is concerned. The epigenetic regulation of gene expression is a common process. It acts during differentiation of what they call the somatic cells. So the fact that a response to environmental cues or stressors and the passing of one of those modulations to the offspring may constitute what we call, of course, epigenetic inheritance and the modification, it could be DNA methylation, histone modification, all those things. But that is really applied to cancer studies. How about NASH? How about cirrhosis? I'm not talking about the alcohol aspect of it or the viral hepatitis. I'm talking about lifestyle or food, you know, or nutrition. Those things are environmental, dietary, and they influence what they call the epigenetic aspect the, on top of the gene, not the DNA sequence, but the tags, you know, what they call the tags that either turn on or turn off genes. So that is where really my, my heart is now because I do a lot of underlying studies trying to understand the mechanisms of disease development, progression, and, and somebody has to look under the hood and see what else is going on down there that is contributing to what we see uh, manifested and different uh, chronic diseases. I would love to see NIH fund that, fund a, con- a multi-center study to do that. Perhaps this is a unique collaboration between NIDDK and the National Institutes of Minority Health and Health Disparities, the Institutes of Bioinformatics. I think this is one of the reasons that we've been hoping for and advocating for from the GLI perspective, a cross NIH focus on liver health, because I think there are a number of really exciting ideas like this that needs significant funding, long-term funding, and really affect the work of several institutes. I'll jump in next because um, obviously Stephen's on the call and I'm just thinking about what could be achievable probably 12 months down the line and I suppose nail it, making sure that we've got that ethnicity split as we were discussing earlier in the conversation to try and look at different non-invasive modalities and techniques and also to see what's acceptable to the community. Which one do they favour? Is it Fibroscan? Is it Fib4? That sort of information could potentially be derived from what was detailed last week on Nailet. That might be achievable in 12 months. It might not, but that's the sort of evidence that we were discussing earlier in this session that might need to be gathered, I suppose. All in your power, Stephen, beyond a grand round. I think one thing that is achievable in a year is at least building into the data collection for Nail in IT the fact that we would like to overcome some of these disparities that we would like to enrich with African Americans in our cohort. And we would target more specifically, you know, our sites in Louisiana and Mississippi and Tennessee, Georgia, South Carolina, where, you know, in LA even, where we have significant numbers of clinical trial sites that that could enroll and do enroll these patients. As far as collecting that data, I think it'll be more than a year. This is a six-year project, so that'll come with time. The other thing I think that we could could do in a year, and I'm going to throw this back to Donna, is rock International Nash Day. Absolutely. You know, but we need help to do that. I, I've done several of my explanatory presentations about how GLI can no longer function on gum and shoestrings. And so if International Nash Day it is to scale to the need that we all know exists to make sure that every member of the public, every type of policymaker, every type of physician has some piece of it that they can own, that they know that NASH applies to them and action to stop NASH now, which will be the theme for 2022, applies to them, then we, we need to do it off of more than just Black Girl Magic. It needs funding and investment from every in the community. Wait, Every- what did you just say, Donna? I didn't hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Come again. That is your February phrase for Black History Month. You're welcome. Black Girl Magic. Did you not know that that's how GLI was invented and how we've gotten so far to this point? That's that's what it's been. The secret's out. But from now on, we're going to do it in dollars or euros. There is an expectation of GLI that I I certainly love living up to as we think about the tens of millions of people who have NASH. If we we think about all of the issues that we have surfaced on just on this podcast, on this one and and the whole, whole series, and we think of the many types of advocacy that need to be brought to bear on the problem, whether that is expertise in in media, whether that is 
expertise in regulatory policy, expertise in healthcare system redesign, expertise in clinical trial recruitment. It needs to be supported at the level that we want it to act. And so I invite everyone to continue to support International NASH Day until it really can do the things that we know it needs to do. So thank you for the opportunity to put that plug in for what can be the community's best moment and really the start of a NASH 365 conversation year long, both for education and more importantly, for action and creating a, a sustainable infrastructure that supports research day in and day out, that supports clinical care to redesign day in and day out, that supports the wraparound services, including defeating food insecurity and the other things that help people not only be adherent and participatory and all the way through a particularly multi-year trial, but helps to keep them connected to care until we have a NASH treatment for those who need it or for those who can be helped with lifestyle and other interventions, that there's a solution for every stage that is personalized and implemented in culture, in language, wherever people need it. I've come too far to think that it is not possible. And so because we make the impossible possible every day here at GLI, and I think International NASH Day can be an incredible moment in 2022 if we all come to the table together. Donna, with you taking the impossible and making it possible and Summit taking a broken piece and making a masterpiece, I mean, you know. Yes. It's... <laughs> Ani, Yanni, things we can see in 12 months. Whichever one you want to go first, go. Everything that you've all said so far about enrollment and increasing enrollment and advancing equity in clinical research, but also just about interventions and how do we ensure that we are creating and implementing interventions that are going to help to reduce disparities that we're seeing here in the United States. So I think a lot about food insecurity. As Donna mentioned, we need a lot of money to really start looking at whether or not these sort of interventions are effective. But I think about how in the, for example, in the world of heart failure, medically tailored meal programs have been shown to be cost effective. And similarly, we can do that and show that in people with cirrhosis and people with NASH and how changing their diets and giving them the resources to change their diets can actually reduce their risk of hospitalization, reduce their risk of death, reduce their risk of developing liver cancer in the future. So I'm thinking about how, how do we design some interventions that are going to really move the needle and change the natural history of what we're seeing so far right now in um, certain disparities in NASH and NAFL. Okay, that's great, Yanni. Yeah, I was going to say, and just to go off of what Ani was saying, I think something similar to you in terms of the interventions, but also, you know, you asked earlier about what are some practical strategies or interventions that could happen to kind of push us towards that. Nova Nordisk, for example, in diabetes space has done studies changing diabetes, which really has went into the communities to truly understand some of their unique challenges, particularly in diabetes, and also figuring out ways to design and implement solutions that are more catered to the cities that are experiencing these, right? So something similar to that, maybe initiation of that in, in the NASH space and different organizations is something I'd like to see. It's also important, I think Donna would appreciate this, it's important to give the power back to the patients as well. And I say that by adding that by educating them, we're giving them the opportunity to be literate about their health and to really go and push so that when they are experiencing or when they're going into clinical setting and they're talking to their physicians, they can be the one to push the agenda forward about NASH and to, to try to be you know screened for this type of thing. So there's so much that has been discussed today and what I like to see is the little things and increasing health literacy, improving food pantries around the country, little things like that, that I believe that could improve social determinants in, in Black Americans and ultimately improve their, their health outcome and reduce progression of uh, fibrosis. So um, it strikes me that we're not spoiled for choice here, right? There are seven, eight, 12 different things that we've identified in the last 15 minutes, each of which would be fantastic. So Donna, I'm rooting for you to um, get out of gum and shoestrings because it strikes me that one of the things that will have to happen is some way for people who care about this issue to help get themselves across between focus and clearinghouse so that the good ideas can benefit not only from funding, but also from energy and enthusiasm, which feels to me a lot like what GLI does every day, frankly. And I, I didn't see this up for that to be where it wound up, but an hour and a half later, here we are. Um, I think everybody has a role to play. If people don't forget to play it, it's a good thing. With that, Unless anyone has a closing comment they want to add, we've been at this for a while. People have already blown their schedules up for the afternoon. And I want to thank all of you. Zaki, Annie, Annie, great first-time contributions. Stephen, Louise, Don, at no surprise, wonderful stuff. Let me let all of you folks say goodbye, and then I'll come back and do the business section in a couple of minutes, okay? Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Say goodbye. Good to see you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye now. After a longer-than-usual episode, here's a shorter-than-usual business report. 
You have just listened to the longest non-conference recording session in the history of Surfing the National Tsunami. A combination of seven impassioned panelists and a broad topic left lots of room for conversation. I learned a ton. I hope you did too. Because the session was so long, I'll limit the business section to two items. 50,000 really does sound like a big number. While we were recording Monday's episode, our total downloads on Buzzsprout suppressed 50,000. 50,000, wow. That's a lot of downloads and some pretty rapid growth. Think of it this way. It took us eight months to get our first 10,000 Buzzsprout downloads and less than eight weeks to get our most recent 10,000. Now, it might take us more than eight weeks to get to 60,000 because January was a huge month, but we continue to build momentum and support and followers as we go. We need your feedback, so be on the lookout for questionnaires. I'll make this as brief as I can. Stephen talks from time to time about the epidemiologic estimate paper that Arun Sanyal was the last author for that predicted accurately the growth rate of Nash and cirrhosis from 2015 to 2030. Chris Estes, who is the lead modeler for that paper, will join us twice in the next three weeks. Next week, he'll join us to discuss the medical and economic value of fatty liver disease testing in the community, a timely topic given that NICE in the UK is ready to rule that it will not reimburse the activity and is accepting comments now. We disagree, and we'll discuss why. Two weeks after that, Chris will be back to talk about what modeling can tell us about which paths for drug development might be more likely to succeed in the market if you can create drugs that work. Between those two sessions, Professor Quentin Anstey from Newcastle will join us along with Dean Tai, Chief Scientific Officer at Histo Index, to discuss the balloon hepatocyte paper that was the big story at Nash Tech. This episode will be sponsored by Histo Index and will include an extra episode about the importance of balloon hepatocyte identification in advanced fibrosis and separately cirrhosis. And at the end of March, Scott Free Freeman returns along with Neil Henderson from the University of Edinburgh and Jonathan Epstein from the University of Pennsylvania to discuss Dr. Epstein's extraordinary work linking CART T cells to mRNA, the kind used in the COVID-19 vaccines to dissolve fibrosis. All four of these episodes have a lot of new and important information. All four should really be can't miss for our listeners. So I want to end today by quickly thanking our team, Magic Mike, Eric, Steve, and Gene, for our continued success as we push forward into larger audiences and new frontiers. More on most of that, particularly new frontiers, in the next few weeks. And with that, I'm off. Stay safe, surf on, and I look forward to seeing you all next week on the podcast. Bye-bye now. Have any questions for the surfers? You can send them to surfingnash.com, and we will answer on the podcast or the website.